Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. Hey, if you still don't know me, my name is Sergey, and I was born in the USSR. Today we're gonna cover one of the questions they got, and the question is, which ones do you think people have a better life, when it was Soviet Union or now? I mean, a better life for average per people, for example, ease of finding job, getting daily needs, etc. I already posted that question on my YouTube community page and uh, there was a quite an interesting response from, say, all three sides, left, right, and middle. And there was another comment uh, about it, comment and a question. So, millions of retirees who are incredibly poor right now because of every former state was, uh, Soviet state was gutted, they just run, right? So, when people, average people, had better life during Soviet Union or now? This basic question is actually quite difficult. And I'll do my best uh, trying to explain my point of view. It's difficult because it's really easy to mix things up answering the question. You know, like we want to compare apples to apples. It won't be fair to compare apples to oranges, or as we say, it's not right to compare a finger with a penis. So let's see, let's try to compare apples to apples first when it comes to retirees. The catch here is that a lot of people who complain, like retirees now in Russia, Ukraine, who complain that their life became way worse compared with Soviet Union, they never were retirees or pensionere, as we say, back in the Soviet Union. Well, think about it. Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, almost 30 years ago. It's easy for me to uh, watch the numbers because I was born in 1971, so I was 20 in 1991, and I will be 50 in 2000, what is it, 2000, uh, oh, 21. I will be 50 in 2021, and it's going to be the 30th anniversary since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So in 2021, there'll be 30 years since Soviet Union collapsed. Now, the retirement age in Soviet Union was 60 years for men and 55 years for women. So if you look at the last year of the Soviet Union, 1991, those people who uh, retired in 1991, in a couple of years, in 2021, the men will be 90 and women will be 85. So I'm trying to say we pretty much didn't have, we shouldn't have right now many retirees, Soviet retirees left. Like they are dying out. If you retired in the last year of 1991, if we're talking people who retired in 80s, they definitely dead by now. So when we compare apples to apples, we need to find retiree from the Soviet days, like maybe from 80s, and compare to the modern days retirees. So let's talk about my grandma Maria. Uh, she was born in 1907, so she retired somewhere around 1963-65. If collective farm workers could retire at 55, I think was the same age because otherwise collective time workers, peasants had a really different situation about their work conditions and uh, they, they didn't really get paid for their work. So my grandma's pension was 12 rubles a month. And I remember it really well because it was one of my uh, responsibilities. I would borrow a bicycle and I ride to post office downtown uh, village, the one that I showed you. If you guys watch my videos about modern Ukraine, I showed that the postal office. So that's about two kilometers. So I'll ride the bike and I'll pick it up in grandma's pension and, and take back to our place. And the buying power of 12 rubles <laughs> was pretty weak. Can we say that? And if you watch my videos about how, what could you buy for one copec, two copex, uh, five copex, I calculated that, that at the prices, at the prices during the eighties and Keep in mind that bread prices were subsidized quite heavily by government. My grandma could purchase 75 loaves of bread for 12 rubles at that time. 
if we look at the prices for vodka, I know it's a horrible comparison, but it was about three rubles per bottle to buy a bottle of vodka. So my grandma's pension was enough to buy four bottles of vodka. So picture if you right now can buy a bottle of vodka for $15. So your pension was 15 times four, $60 a month. So it's like if you're looking at the prices of vodka in America right now, so that equals to $60 a month. That's what my grandma's pension was. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it looks like prices for color TVs in the United States and in the Soviet Union around early 1980s were about the same. We had 600 rubles in Soviet Union, and here 19-inch color TV was about $600. So the only difference, uh, yours TV had remote control and... Soviet electrons didn't have remote controls at that time. And I don't know what would be the average social security check for some farmer or, you know, some kind of agriculture worker back in the 80s. But my grandma, in order to buy a color TV, she had to wait and save every penny, I mean, every copic for over four years in order to buy a color TV. So no wonder... Uh, most uh, peasants in our village, if they had a TV, it would be black and white. But uh, a lot of people around, they didn't have TV at all, like my grandparents. And those ones that have TVs, they were old uh, black and white models from 70s. But the key numbers, my grandma's pension during the Soviet Union in the early 1980s was 12 rubles equal 75 loaves of bread at the government subsidized prices. And now let's jump in the present day and look at my mother's pension. So she worked for many years, I think her stage, so you know, they also take into calculation how many years you worked. She's getting right now 2,000 grivnas. It's her pension and it's about $80 if you uh, calculate. It's currently the rate of exchange is 25 grivnas per each dollar. And that's not a lot of money. It's slightly above the minimal pension right now in Ukraine. But still, with that pension, that it's not enough to live in the city because utility is going to pretty much take most of it if you own an apartment like in Kiev. But she still, with 2,000 grivnas, uh, my mother could purchase right now 166 loaves of bread. Same bread, same bakery as my grandma could buy only 75. So if you compare apples to apples, breads to breads, current pensions is actually almost, actually not almost, more than double buying power comparing with what my grandmother had in early 1980. Of course you can say, well, comrade Sergei, it doesn't make sense. Why would people complain that their life standards dropped drastically after Soviet Union collapsed if according to your calculations your grandma pension was twice less than your mother's pension and my mom complains my fa father who is in Kiev and he makes about a hundred dollars a month so he makes a little bit more than my mom makes like earns in the pension uh, they both complain that it's not enough money so let's look at that angle in my unprofessional opinion because I'm not a economist or anything like that the Soviet Union was a quite a comfortable country for poor people so they didn't pay a lot to workers they paid literally peanuts to the retirees but because the housing was not expensive you didn't own the housing if you like it to get apartment from the government it was like a really inexpensive rent and utilities were also very, very inexpensive. So it was way more comfortable, easier to be a poor person in Soviet Union versus modern days when we have market forces. So of course, prices went up quite a bit on many things. I mean, on some items that went down like cars got way cheaper compared to what Lado was costing in 70s and 80s. So now it's not comfortable to be a poor person in Russia or Ukraine. And I think, I think that's the main difference. For example, 
Back in the Soviet days, like we lived in a three-room apartment in Kiev, we had to pay based on the size of the apartment. As I said it was like a inexpensive rent. Well, in our case, we bought the apartment. I had a separate video about it. But if the person got the apartment uh, for free from the government, or actually they get it from the place of their work, so most factories and other businesses, would say businesses. They had a waiting list. For example, you start a job and in 20 years, some places they claim in 10 years after you wait, you'll get apartment, but you still have to pay based on the, how many rooms and how big is the apartment. There was just like maybe seven or 10 rubles a month rent. And then utilities were very ex inexpensive. The only meter we had back in the Soviet days was only for electricity. So Soviet people were really aware about cost of electricity because it had a meter. So from day one, I learned as a kid to constantly turn on the lights off. But at the same time, natural gas was unlimited. We never had any meter on the natural gas. So you can cook or burn your stove all day, same price. Same with the hot water and the cold water. Like we had actually two pipes going into sinks, so you have a hot water and cold water, no meters. So same thing, you can have it wide open all day, all night, and you pay the same price. But now, everything changed. We had gas meter installed in our kitchen in Kiev. They had a water meter installed in the bathroom too. And now my brother, for example, he had to install his own boiler because it's cheaper to heat up the water locally versus getting hot water supply, like central hot water supply, and then you pay way more money. So they figure out it's cheaper to burn more electricity, but that way you're gonna uh, save money on hot water supply. So now everything is metered, gas, water, and of course electricity. So all the utilities went up in price quite a bit. And currently, like in the winter, they had to pay about 1400 grivnas a month as the utilities and you know if your pension is 2000 grivnas and you have to pay 1400 just to live in an apartment there's not much money left to buy food i'm not talking about even buy some clothing or any kind of entertainment so if we compare life of the soviet retiree versus the life of the retiree in the modern ukraine money wise modern retirees are ahead but utility expenses jump quite a bit, and that's what pinched them really hard. And of course, in reality, you think, okay, if I had my own apartment that I can't afford in Kiev, there's a possibility to move out of the country to some village like my mother lives. You can purchase a house for $500, maybe $4,000, and then you can rent your apartment for four or $500 a month. And it's actually be a great uh, substitute to your income you'll have more in rent, almost five times more, six times more in rent than you uh, have in your pension. But of course, a lot of people, they just, they grew up, who especially who grew up in the city, they can't even think about something like that, just to abandon city, move out of the country, have this primitive country life, maybe use outhouse. Uh, they prefer to remain in the city and complain and ask for more money. But it's just mentality of people. So we finished comparing retirees to retirees, but now let's look at people who right now retired and well, like, like my mom, you know, they are baby boomers. So they worked during the Soviet days and now they retired and they do complain because their income dropped significantly comparing what they worked in Soviet Union versus what they get as a pension now in Ukraine or Russia, but now we're not comparing apples to apples. I think most of the countries, your income drops after you quit working and you retire. If the question is, you know, in America, for example, you know, what do you can count? Maybe two, three thousand dollars a month social security uh, payment if you worked all your life and made decent money. So it's, you know, you can always also complain like my life got worse uh, since I retired. I mean, I met quite a few Americans 
uh, what were complaining. Well, back when I used to work at Whirlpool and I was a manager, I could afford anything, but now I got to watch my uh, every penny. But, you know, would you blame a system for it or would you blame a person that they didn't save enough money or, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, my father is a perfect example of baby boomer, Soviet baby boomer. He was born in 1946. And when I was asking him questions about pension and what he used to make, he actually got really upset and fired up. According to his calculations, he used to make 30,000 grivnas. Like if you compare, uh, you know, what you could buy, he's making right now, his pension is 2,500. He And he thinks he used to make in the same currency 30,000. So it's basically tenfold drop in your income. So of course it hurts. And I said, and situation like 1400 goes for the utilities and all you have left is just barely like $40 a month uh, to spend on groceries and any other miscellaneous expenses. So the main problem I see with people who complain that their life got way worse since the collapse of Soviet Union and those people are mostly retire retirees right now is right at the end in the early 90s Soviet government blocked access to people's savings. Like we had the only bank in Soviet Union, Sberbank. And when the whole situation started unwinding and Soviet Union started being wobbly, if I can say it that way, they froze our bank accounts. Like people had no access to their savings. And one more time, it was done during Soviet Union by our communist leadership. And so they block the access to savings. I mean, everyday life people deal with cash. It's only savings that we kept in the bank. And I think they paid like 3% interest rate. Uh, but otherwise you get paid at work with cash. You paid for everything cash. We didn't have anything like checks at all or money orders. It was cash or you just put money in the savings account. So it was locked for years. I mean, Soviet Union collapsed. And those accounts were locked, then inflation kicked in. So when finally in Ukraine, they said, okay, now you have access to your money. For what my mom saved and was 5,000 rubles, you could buy two loaves of bread at that time. So we had a really horrible inflation. So our family lost 5,000 rubles, which is worth close to two years of family income. Together, my parents were making around 300 rubles a month while they're working. So once again, you know, my grandma's pension was 12 rubles. My mom's salary was 120 rubles, 10 times more. So we lost, our family lost 5,000 rubles, huge amount of money. But I know many other people who lost quite more, way more. For example, uh, mother of one of my friends, she was single mother and uh, uh, she got pregnant by the military pilot who was married but never told her. her. So he was playing, uh, child, paying really good child support for years. And she never touched that money. She always put it in the Sberbank to her, on her son's savings account. So she lost 25,000 rubles, five times more than we did. Huge amount of money. Never got recovered. And that's happened all over the Soviet Union. So this is, I think, one of the major problems with modern days retirees. They were saving some money, maybe for kids, maybe for themselves, but then they got robbed by the Soviet Union government, by the communists. And then when they retired, the current pension is not enough sufficient, but then they lost all their savings from the Soviet days. So that would be, I'd say, main, main problem with their financial situations right now. But on the other hand, if you look at the pictures of Moscow in 1980s, and you look at the pictures of Moscow or Kiev in modern days, we have so many cars, we have traffic jams, we got all the Western McDonald's and supermarkets, and high rises and business centers. So if you look like that way, it definitely seems as country become richer after collapse of the Soviet Union. If you ever travel to Europe, Paris, Spain, Greece, even United States, now you can always hear Russian voices. There's so many Russian tourists everywhere. During the Soviet days, 
there'll be little groups escorted by KGB agents. And now thousands of Russians travel over the world. So there's a quite a few people that have way better life now than they used to have during the Soviet Union. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, if you have any questions, please post in the comments below this video. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to share with your friends and on social media. Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, товарищи. In this video, I would like to get a little bit more into details about life of the average people before and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And to those who are still wondering who the hell is that guy and why does he think that he knows everything about Soviet Union, well, my name is Sergey and I was born in the USSR. So we're back to the question from one of my viewers. Which ones do you think people have a better life when it was Soviet Union or now? I mean, a better life for average people. For example, ease of finding a job, getting daily needs, etc. So today we're going to look at the part of ease of finding a job and getting daily needs. Uh, we'll look at those, how the people had those problems solved during the Soviet Union and after the collapse of USSR in 1991. And by the way, thank you so much to everyone who participated in the conversation in my previous video, Life After Collapse of the Soviet Union Part 1. Uh, there are like over 200 comments under that video, a lot of great suggestions, great ideas, some questions that kind of question my knowledge of situation. And I want to remind everyone, I'm not a professional economist. I just happened to live there. At that time, I didn't think that much about life in Soviet Union because I just lived there. But now looking back, I started to come up with different ideas. And that's what I would like to share with you. In my quest to compare apples to apples, I used examples of my grandmother and my mother to compare their lifestyles and their pensions during the Soviet Union and after. But of course, big picture situation was way more complicated. Some people had very, very good pension in the Soviet Union. For example, Comrade Nikita Khrushchev, after he was forcefully retired, he became a retiree of government, like state level, they call it, Sayuz uh, Mashtaba, And his pension was around 500 rubles per month, more than my family combined could earn in or about, but in two months, his pension in one month was equal to family income of, of my parents in two months. Another category of people who had great pensions were coal miners. They were getting paid really well, around 500 rubles a month, and their pension was very high due to the condition of their work, but of course they did enjoy that pension for a long time because their health was quite poor after working in the coal mines all their life. Another group of people had really great retirement benefits were retired army officers, and of course as a higher rank you had when you retire, and as longer you served in the Soviet army, as better your pension was. So those guys had a great pensions too. And now back to the question. Let's talk about how easy it was to find a job during the Soviet Union and after, and how easy it was about getting your daily needs before and after. If we talk about jobs in the Soviet Union, we need to remember right away about the biggest achievement of the socialist system, about 0% unemployment. It sounds great, but you need to remember that it was illegal in the Soviet Union not to work without excuse. So you could get in trouble, and I'm talking up to going to jail, if you didn't work for th up to three months. So you could be unemployed for up to three months. And after that, if you didn't have a valid excuse, like you're sick or you became handicapped or you have to take care of your sick relative, you could be called a parasite of society and you could get arrested and sent to jail. And I believe it was like up to three years for the serious offenses. So of course, 
We always had 100% employment since unemployment was illegal. The way I see it, for example, if you ask anybody how many drug dealers are officially working, doing their business in Chicago or New York City or LA, officially there's none, but probably there's plenty of them because it's illegal to be a drug dealer. Same way, if it's illegal to be unemployed, then you have 0% official unemployment. And of course, some shady characters, any country, any system had shady characters, would find a way to dodge the system, to dodge this unemployment rule. So for example, if you may be doing some illegal business and you have income that you can live on and you don't want to work, you can cut a deal with someone that puts you on the books like you're employed and they will keep your salary but they will keep you on the book. So it looks like you're working, coming to work every day, and the boss, the manager of that company will be just pocketing the salary. So, you know, if there is the will, there is the way. And I'm not an economist, but the idea of 100% employment sounds a little bit fishy, almost like impractical. You know, you think about any system, you always need to have some margin of safety. You can't have the system be run like at 100% all the time. So same way, for example, if the Soviet economy was growing, but you have 100% employment, 0% unemployment. So if you build new factories, where are you going to find workers to fill the positions since everyone is already working? So that means you're going to rob other places of workers, which quite often happen when people from the villages, peasants, like their children will live in villages and join in the workforce in the cities to work at the factories and such. And then, of course, the agriculture was slowly dying out because it was less and less people to work the field. So I believe it was quite easy to find a job in the Soviet Union, but was it easy to find a good job in the Soviet Union? That's a million-ruble question because in the Soviet days, since government controlled the salaries, so, you know, the guy, if you're a manager of factory or a collective farm, you can't just make your mind and say, oh, I want to pay the guys more because I want to attract uh, better, you know, qualified people. You couldn't do anything like that. So how would you attract the talent if the people, if you must pay exactly the same money as the factory across the street? At the same time, workers would consider jobs based on what kind of additional benefits they could get out of the job. And what I mean, what could you steal from the factory or whatever, from the store? Because pay was the same everywhere. But if you work, for example, like my father, he was a spray painter in Antonov airplane factory. So since he was using paint, he could steal paint or other chemicals that you used during painting, then you could sell it or trade it with other people. So a lot of times that was not about salary, it was about what kind of access to what kind of goods you're going to get. So people who worked at the warehouse system, like shoe warehouses, food warehouses, all those places were golden mines because you had access to the goods, you had access to deficit. And then at the factories, People were stealing, and it was a quite a bad issue for the government because they actually had like a struggle with so-called nisuni. Nisun, it's like carrier. So you carry something out of the door of your work. So you nisun. So there was the whole thing about battle against this situation when people steal stuff from the factories, from their places of work. There's an example for you. My brother's father-in-law, during the Soviet days, he was a top manager, so like he was director. So director, I guess you can call it, of a local distillery. So that was just a plant that processed wheat into pure alcohol, and then it was shipped out to the factories producing vodka. So he still, and we're talking now, has in his basement bottles and bottles of this pure alcohol from Soviet days that he 
slowly accumulated for all those 10 or 20 years while he was a director of distillery. So everyone was taking advantage if they could by stealing stuff, stealing goods at the places of work. Even in schools, ladies that work the cafeteria or the people who work at Stalovaya, at the factories when they fed their workers, everything was made from scratch. There was no Cisco semi-trailers bringing frozen goods that you just need to unpack and cook it. You know, they had to uh, bring potatoes, butter, everything in bulk, and then you just make stuff with it. So, of course, you could cut down on required amount of butter, of bread, meat, and people will sneak it out. So even children were robbed of their proper nutrition because people at the kitchen will quietly use less ingredients in order to take home meat, butter, sour cream, whatever. And now you think the situation changed. Now it's all about money. It used to be all about goods. Now in modern Russia, modern Ukraine, it's all about money. Because people, different companies, different stores pay different salaries. So now we're looking for highest, uh, bitter highest pay you can get. And at the same time, during the Soviet days, retail was really like the best job you can get because of the access to goods. Now retail is the crappiest job because it's, you can't steal it, it's private owned, so people watch you like hawks. At the same time, pay is not that great. So that's one of the reasons why in the Soviet Union, waiters, for example, if they, you work at some good restaurant, the waiters and waitresses, they were like jet set society. They had tons of money. And at the same time, we had a lot of jokes about poor engineers because of officially engineers were making way more money than waitresses. But since they had access to the black caviar, to whatever other foods they could, they could resell, they were really rich, making a lot of money. And engineers, you know, if you work as an engineer, what can you steal? You know, especially if you work like in the designing something, all you have is just a paper and a pencil. So we had a lot of jokes about poor, broke engineers. Now we're talking about the second part of the question about getting your daily needs. And here, of course, huge changes because we always had, as was the word of everyday life in Soviet Union, is deficit, shortage of items of consumer goods. So the worst case scenario, I mentioned that many times, you had to wait on the be in a waiting list for nine years to purchase Jiguli Lada car. Then other items like refrigerators and some other furniture, couches, waiting list could be three years, two years, six months. So getting a daily needs was pretty challenging business back in the Soviet days. Even groceries, you know, we live in Kiev, capital of Ukraine. So we were on a like number two level for supplying. I already mentioned several times that in Soviet Union, it was quite different situation in the stores depending where you live. So like Moscow, since it was the capital of Soviet Union, they had priority, like they were number one to supply in the country. So stores in Moscow were pretty much always packed full. I mean, variety wasn't that huge and sometimes it's great. Like we had one kind of, uh, two kinds of salt. You know, we had a coarse salt, salt, and then we had really fine, like fine salt. I don't know how to call it. So you have like a rock salt, which is core, big chunks. And then you had those fine salt called extra. One type of sugar. We never had brown sugar. We never had powdered sugar. And so everything was, you know, one brand, one kind. But as I said, Moscow was supplied really well, then maybe Leningrad was pretty close. Then you had the capitals of the Soviet republics. They were like next step down. So we we were stuck pretty well. Like you don't have everything all the time, but we didn't really like needed to f struggle to find uh, groceries. And then you go down the list and like in the village when I spent every summer, they brought delivered bread to that store 
only three times a week. Otherwise, it was no bread. And people were waiting in line for like hour, two hours, waiting for the bread truck to arrive so they can buy some bread. And such huge difference in supply. You know, here in America, you go to Walmart somewhere by the big city or you go to Walmart in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. You have exactly the same selection, same choices. Now you have Moscow that has different kind of sausages and meats and anything else. And then 200 kilometers east, there some be some town that had empty stores. So this created a situation, I already mentioned about it, so-called sausage trains, where people would travel a day or two days by train to Moscow to do their grocery shopping. So, for example, it could be a situation like there would be meat processing plant in Saratov. I'm just kind of randomly picking the city. But all the produce, all their sausages and kalbasas will be shipped to Moscow. And then people from Saratov will take a train to go to Moscow to buy that kalbasa that they manufacture and take it back. So sausage trains were one of the way people were uh, going grocery shop and taking a train for a day or two day trip uh, to load up on the sausages and other uh, goods they couldn't buy at their home. And of course now we have uh, supermarkets everywhere. The selection is out of this world. And honestly, like I still, like for me going to supermarket in America is totally okay. I get used to it. You know, I got spoiled with all the selection and varieties. But then when I go to Ukraine, my brain still can't process. I cannot just accept the new reality because I grew up at the times when you needed to hit like five stores in order to get your shopping list. I mean, we didn't really have shopping lists. But for example, my mom says, hey, we need bread, we need milk, we need sour cream, we need eggs. You can't find everything in one store. So you just check this store. Okay, they still have bread. Get some bread. Then you walk for two kilometers. Hey, but they still have eggs. I got some eggs. So you have to hit quite a bit of stores to get all your needs, all your groceries. And I said, now you go in the supermarket and this whole selection that they offer, I'm just going nuts. It's like, where did you hide all this stuff during the Soviet days? Because... I remember every collective farm was working like crazy. We had all the fields were planted with wheat and beets and potatoes. You know, there was so much activity going on. Now you go out in the country, you watch my modern Ukraine videos, and it's like dead. Villages are dying out. Most collective farms are closed. Buildings collapsed. But at the same time, there's so much food stuffs bunch of different varieties, all kind of things you can only imagine for sale at every supermarket on every corner. And people used to run, as I said, between stores to snatch eggs or to snatch some fish. But the easy thing was prices were the same everywhere. Now, like my father, he runs, goes to different supermarkets, but not because of selection, not because he needed eggs. And one supermarket had eggs and one didn't. But because something is cheaper in this supermarket, you know, they have maybe promotion or whatever sale. So he'll go specifically to save a dollar here. Then he goes to a different store, buy bread there because it's a little bit cheaper there. So the, he still runs around visiting maybe three, four supermarkets, but not because of the shortage of goods, but because of shortage of money and that he can save, you know, six grivnas here, five grivnas there. For me, it would be like not worth the time. But with, you know, if your pension $70 a month or $100 a month, 50 cents dollar, that's a lot of money to save. So wrapping up the question, when did people have a better life? It's kind of the same, but flipped upside down in Soviet Union. We had some money, not much, but we hardly had any goods to buy. Now there's more than enough goods to buy, but people have no money or not enough money to buy what they need. So it kind of flip-flopped. 
Now it's more goods, less money. Before there was more money, less goods. So I personally prefer to have a better selection and maybe less money. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I appreciate your comments, your likes. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. It's Ushanka Show. Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Ushanka Show. Stories about life in the Soviet Union. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи! В эфире программа Ушанка Шоу. If you're new to my channel, my name is Sergey, and back in 1971, I was born in the USSR. So today I would like to talk to you guys about top reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed back in 1991. I received quite a few questions and comments on this topic, the top reasons why Soviet Union collapsed. And actually, before we start, I would like you to pause this video and type what you think the top reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed. If you ask this question any older person in modern Russia and maybe modern Ukraine, especially those people that still miss the USSR so-called Sovkadrochery, they probably will give you this one answer. They will tell you it's all because of Mikhail Gorbachev, that traitor CIA agent that destroyed the Soviet Union. Personally, I don't think Mikhail Gorbachev destroyed Soviet Union on purpose. It was just kind of like he meant to fix it and as a result everything collapsed. I see his dilemma back in the 80s like this. He saw that the Soviet dam was showing cracks. So in order to relieve the pressure he decided, okay, I'll make a couple of holes in this dam to relieve the pressure, but when he poked the hole, there was so much pressure behind this wall that it just, the whole uh, thing just collapsed and went down. But to be fair, I need to mention that some time ago, Mikhail Gorbachev mentioned something crazy that the main purpose of his life was to destroy communism. I think he is lying, he's just trying to get another Pizza Hut advertising deal. But as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people in Russia will tell you that they strongly believe that Gorbachev was a CIA agent of influence and he did destruction of the Soviet Union on purpose. Reason number two, socialism doesn't work. And I made a lot of videos when I talk about life in the Soviet Union. It's kind of like a silver lining going on from video to video, how ineffective was Soviet economy, how ineffective was central planning, and how people worked as less as possible and were stealing as much as possible. So all those things were just kind of showing you that socialism economy really doesn't work. But once again, in order to be fair, I need to mention that technically Soviet Union never had socialism. I don't want to get in technicality, but it was more like state capitalism style economy with central planning. Because if you look at the definition of socialism, it should be like workers owning factories, not the government. And what usually I provide as a proof that socialism, essential planning doesn't really work, is the situation with wheat. Soviet Union used to be one of the biggest grain importers in the world. Like, Soviet people would be probably starving if... Soviet government would be purchasing grains from United States, from Canada, from Australia, I believe from Argentina as well. So for years, we couldn't feed our own people. Soviet Union didn't produce enough grain to feed its own people. And it's despite central planned economy, despite the five-year plans, we just never ever had enough grain to make bread. Fast forward in the modern days and you know, we're talking before this horrible war began, Russia became a number one producer of wheat in the world. Ukraine is number five. Together, these two former Soviet republics produce like almost a quarter of all the grain wheat in the world. And that's without central planning. This is without any five-year plans. It's just farmers went after profits, they became more effective, they purchased modern equipment, those uh, famous tractors that drag uh, broken down Russian military equipment. So from the country that couldn't feed itself, Russia and Ukraine became 
countries that feed the world. Reason number three arms race during the Cold War. A lot of my viewers mentioned that reason in their comments that arms race with the United States, that's what really broke Soviet economy. We just couldn't keep up. We spent so much money making those thousands of tanks and other equipment and it's just that was too much too much for the soviet economy to handle and i have to agree here i honestly am thinking uh, if the soviet union would have like more open mind and modern thinking and move away from this world war ii era strategies we need we need ten thousand tanks that we can you know roll through the western europe and just maybe concentrate on manufacturing uh, high quality nuclear weapons, tactical and strategical, and then you just pretty much um, make sure West knows that you can wipe off the surface of the earth any country that mess with Soviet Union and then quit manufacturing everything else in those large quantities. But of course, back in the Soviet days, I wasn't the guy who was making those decisions. Although my grandfather, he always was saying that I was quite smart and one day I should replace Brezhnev as the leader of the Soviet Union. But the arms race was the America definitely created a huge burden on Soviet economy. Pretty much every factory was doing, making something for military. It was called Rabotet na Vajenku, work for Vajenka is like a military kind of terminology slang. So it's a lot of money and resources were wasted on weapons. Reason number four, Soviet war in Afghanistan. By the way, that war was also never called a war. It was also some kind of special military operation. And if soldiers were called, they were Voini Internationalisti. So they were like international warriors and they came to uh, perform their international duty to help Afghan people to do something. That war lasted pretty much 10 years, from 1979 to 1989. Soviet Union lost 15,000 troops killed, and that's official number. There's some people mentioning that probably that amount is double. Up to 30,000 people got killed during that 10 year fighting. And besides the human losses, the cost of that war was just huge. So that was definitely another punch you know, like we're talking about boxing match, there was another giant punch in the gut on the Soviet economy. And no wonder that the troops were pulled out of Afghanistan in 1989. And just two years later, Soviet Union ceased to exist. Reason number five, aftermath of Chernobyl disaster back in 1986. Many of my viewers mentioned Chernobyl is one of the reasons Soviet Union collapsed because definitely the cost of dealing with all the bad stuff that happened after explosion. I don't know how many billions and billions of rubles were spent trying to contain. It definitely didn't help Soviet economy. Okay, so that was my quick review of top five reasons why Soviet Union collapsed. Mikhail Gorbachev, socialism, arms race, war in Afghanistan, and Chernobyl disaster. And now I want to tell you a couple more that I think needs to be mentioned. I think that another straw that helped to break the Soviet economy back was Soviet subsidized housing. Housing in the Soviet Union is the favorite topic for any tanky. They were just so happy to tell you that housing in the Soviet Union was free, which is not true. And I talked about many, many times. It was subsidized housing, so people never owned an apartment and we're talking about apartments in cities but the rent was really cheap and average person paid about 10 percent of their monthly income i'm talking individual person not the whole family so definitely soviet housing was uh, very affordable so since the housing was so heavily subsidized soviet economy was losing money with every new apartment building being built and they built a lot of them especially during Nikita Khrushchev era and Brezhnev era they were really building all over the Soviet Union so every building was 
additional drag on the Soviet economy. So you lose money after building, then of course, as years go by, all the maintenance and repairs was also coming out of the government pocket. So there's, you know, it's older the building is more expensive it's to maintain it. And so it was adding more and more expense to the economy. Mm -hmm. And to make the matters worse, we did not really have any meters except electrical meters. So there was no water meters. You could use hot water or cold water. You can run it 24 seven and you paid exactly the same amount of money based on how many people lived in the apartment. Same thing with natural gas. You could cook all day long. And actually it helped my mom quite a bit when she was trying to make extra money in the 90s. She was cooking pies, meat pies, and sell them on the street. And we didn't have to pay any extra money, although she was cooking a lot. So once again, it was really expensive to have those buildings because they had no meters. So people were quite wasteful, it's just the way it is. If you don't pay for something, you don't care about saving it. Oddly enough, electricity was quite expensive. So we had meters and it was four copecks per kilowatt. And if you look at the average salary of 150 rubles per month, picture if you make $1,500 a month take home and picture paying 40 cents per kilowatt, that's a lot of money. So I grew up turning the lights off always. That was the first thing that parents will teach you as a kid, turn off the lights if you don't need it. Another big problem with Soviet apartment buildings was that since no one cared about being energy efficient, there was just let's build it as quick as possible and as cheap as possible. All those apartment buildings, they weren't energy efficient. They were losing heat through the cracks, through the poor insulation, wooden single pane windows. So it was also another huge drag on maintaining just those buildings warm in the winter. Of course, we didn't have air conditioning, so nobody cared. So that was another uh, big expense to maintain those buildings. So considering all these problems with this apartment housing, I wonder maybe Soviet Union was spending at least as much on the housing as it was spending on the military arms race. Okay, so that was reason number six, ineffective and very expensive Soviet housing. Let's talk about reason number seven. Развитие Сибири и Дальнего Востока. Development of Siberia and the Far East. When I think about the Soviet Union, the largest country in the world, and about modern Russia, still the largest country in the world, what comes to my mind is the movie Shrek. Remember that part when they crawl to this castle surrounded by the ring of fire? And Shrek said, Sure, it's big, but look at the location. That applies to modern Russia as well as the Soviet Union. Mm. I'm not sure that a lot of people realize that simple fact, how far north Russia is located. So if you move Russia to the Northern America, you will see that Russia is pretty much just a bigger Canada. And Moscow, for example, is located like where Anchorage, Alaska. For example, I live in Southwest Michigan, which is kind of Northern United States, right? I mean, you can go a little bit more North, but not much. The same location, it's the further South. So Southwest Michigan is about where the South of Crimea, the most Southern kind of point of the former Soviet Union. And of course, uh, there are quite a bit of difference in climate between Canada and Russia. You know, when you talk about Gulf Stream, kind of helping with heating up a little bit northern areas around Murmansk, Arhangelsk, and so on. But still, you know, it, there's a lot of similarities. And if you look at Canada, there's not much going on just moving up a little bit north from the border with the United States. That country is empty. Why? Because it's just too expensive 
to develop anything there. I mean, there's maybe a little towns around the holes in the ground when they dig some minerals or gold or whatever else. So it just doesn't make sense to develop those areas and hardly anything going on there. Now, if you look at the map of Soviet Union or modern Russia, you'll see that Siberia has a lot, quite large cities. So Soviet government spent a lot of money and effort on so-called Развитие Сибири или освоение Сибири, development of Siberia. So they pumped a lot of money in creating these large cities, middle of nowhere. I mean, they were kind of located by the rivers and such. And then they spent a lot of money convincing people to go there. Well, during the Stalin era, there was not much convincing going on. Just thousands and thousands of people were arrested and then sent to Gulag labor camps in Siberia. Later on, especially during the Brezhnev times, government began offering uh, so-called Severne Nadbavki, so it's like a northern bonuses. So people, if they would move to Siberia to live and work, they'll get paid more money for the same type of uh, work they will do back home. So for example, just a regular teacher, if she made 150 rubles in Kiev, moving to Siberia in five years, she will get double her pay. So that was quite the, in, an incentive for people to move to Siberia uh, to make money. At least you stay there temporarily for 10, 20 years, make enough money and then move back. So I believe it was a huge expense for the government. First of all, developing those areas, building new cities, building apartment buildings, factories, and then offering so much extra money for people to move there. And of course, once again, Soviet housing, not energy efficient. So keeping those homes warm, supplying them with water and natural gas without meters, all that was very, very expensive. So no wonder that in modern Russia, government began uh, reducing and canceling Severne and Babkid's northern bonuses, which created totally new problem. Now it was a reverse migration. So before people were moving to Siberia to make good money, they would they were willing to live in the harsh conditions, you know, long, cold winters, not much sunshine, a lot of snow, short summers, but money were good. Now those bonuses started shrinking. So we have now a reverse migration when people abandon those cities, they sell their apartments and they move somewhere more south or into the European part of this uh, Russia, like Moscow, Leningrad. A lot of people actually move into Krasnodar region, which is one of the most southernmost area of Russia. So I said, as a result, there's only a couple of areas in modern Russia, the population is actually growing. One of them is Krasnodarsky Krai. So that's that southern area and of course, uh, largest cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg and a huge, huge swath of uh, territory in the Far East and Siberia uh, population there literally collapsing. So I believe this wasteful development of Siberia and the Far East was another nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union. Well, my friends, it's all I have for you today. If you have something else you can think of, of the reasons why Soviet Union collapsed, uh, please post in your comments. We'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. Потому что если дороги будут, то по ним неприятель проедет и прямо в сердце России попадет. Я с ними согласен абсолютно.